lovely to meet you all, although it's virtual. So I'm Davia and I'm a UK and New Zealand trained ophthalmologist with special training in glaucoma. So I tend to work both in public and private in Auckland. So I'm based at Green Lane and also at the Eye Institute. Um, so today, what I'm hoping to cover is what are aspects in ophthalmic consultation with a bit more of a glaucoma focus. So I suppose the first question is why consider being prepared for these assessments? Uh, what I realize is that uh, there are lots of patients who are quite anxious about the assessment. So um, what felt, well, I felt that it, doing a presentation like this would reduce your anxiety prior to the consultation. Also, if you're anything like me, I like to be prepared for my visit with lots of questions. So if you know what to expect, then you're going to be in a much better situation of asking the questions which pertain to you. Uh, you may also want to research uh, an area so you ask the right questions, although there's no such thing as a wrong question. And finally, it makes you feel empowered. It makes you feel prepared that you are going to make, be making the right decisions about your own condition. Okay, so this is a journey that I'm hoping to take you on today. Uh, we're going to talk about who may be, who you may be potentially seeing, what the process of the consultation is like, and I'm going to conclude with some of the most important points of this uh, talk today. Okay, so who will you be seeing? There are so many of us uh, who work in an eye clinic or an eye hospital, and I thought it would be useful to break down who you will be seeing and what your roles are. So, um, and before I start off on this, I think it's really crucial that you ask the person who you're seeing what the position is. And it's, it's not too rude to ask. I mean, um, in I Institute, I've got a little badge that says that I'm a ophthalmologist, but in public, uh, there is a lanyard with a badge which says that I'm an ophthalmologist. Um, and that should apply to all staff. And if you don't have the opportunity to see it, you can definitely ask them what your qualifications are, what your position is, uh, and it's not rude to ask. Now, a technician is an individual who's been trained to run tests uh, and also to assess vision. An optometrist is an individual who's gone to university and it takes about five years to train to be an optometrist and they're very skilled at examining the eye and dispensing glasses and contact lenses. Now um, under the umbrella of optometrists there are special optometrists who are trained in prescribing glaucoma medications and these are glaucoma prescribing optometrists um, and <clears throat> These optometrists run, um, they attend course and they run workshops on how to diagnose glaucoma and how to manage glaucoma. And, and they can all prescribe glaucoma medications. So if you're in a place where trying to access your doctor or your ophthalmologist is very hard, then having a relationship with a glaucoma prescribing optometrist is very useful because you can attend lots of your follow-ups and a lot of us ophthalmologists have very close relationships with them and so they can actually co-manage your glaucoma with the consultant and prescribe medications for you. Now a house officer or a house surgeon and a registrar are doctors who are training in ophthalmology. So they haven't finished their training in ophthalmology but they are also doctors and so, so frequently particularly if you attend a public hospital, you may be seen, uh, be seen by a house officer or registrar and they assess you and they usually go and discuss the plan or your treatment and findings when an ophthalmologist in touch is based with you. Um, and finally, an ophthalmologist. An ophthalmologist is a senior doctor. We finished our training in ophthalmology and we are eye surgeons. Now, whilst most ophthalmologists can diagnose glaucoma, there are fellowship trained ophthalmologists and these are, um, are ophthalmologists who've gone to do uh, special training in the area of expertise. And I'm a glaucoma fellowship trained ophthalmologist. And so that fellowship um, usually is done overseas, but it can also be done in New Zealand. Um, but that is um, usually of a period of a minimum of a year away to do this extra bits of training. 
So um, your glaucoma fellowship trained ophthalmologist is going to be the expert matter in the treatment and management of glaucoma. Okay, so moving on to the consultation. So the first part of the consultation is called a history. And this is the conversation that you get uh, started with in your consultation. And sometimes uh, this can even get started prior to you attending your consultation. And that is because we have, we usually get a copy of your referral letter. Now it's important for you to also get a copy of your referral letter prior to your consultation um, as so that you understand why you are attending that consultation because unfortunately uh, things can go missing. Uh, from my perspective, when I get a referral letter, uh, the referrer usually has a specific question that they would like answered in the letter. So I would usually start off my consultation with drawing the attention of the patient to that clinical question. But normally a patient may have other questions uh, during that consultation. So, I'll tend, so I tend to ask them, is there anything other than what's in the letter that they would like to discuss with me further? So ensure that you have a copy of the referral letter and ask your referrer, so i.e. either the doctor or the optometrist, if you do not understand parts of this letter. And obviously ask the clinician in front of you too if there's uh, aspects that you don't understand. Now, many patients assume that we have a copy of your medical records. Unfortunately, due to DHB privacy restrictions, we cannot access your notes or transfer files easily. So, um, and we certainly cannot access your general practitioner notes. So you should ask your GP for a copy of your medical history and also your medical uh, medication list. And this has major implications on what medications we can give you, for example, uh, if you are on some, um, if you've got allergies to beta blockers, for example, then we can't give you Timolol. If you have asthma, then you couldn't, we can't give you beta blockers too. Uh, if you're on blood thinners, um, then that means that you have a ble bleeding tendency. And as such, we may have to do certain modifications for the time of surgery. And let us know also if you're taking any herbal medications such as ginkgo, um, these medications can also have an impact on your bleeding tendency. Okay, so prepare any previous clinical documentations that you may have about previous eye surgery or any conditions that you may have. Uh, some patients forget that they've had surgery, such as laser refractive surgery. And for example, laser refractive surgery, such as LASIK, can cause your pressure to be artificially reduced. Um, injuries such as uh, trauma at a much early, earlier stage that can give rise to secondary uh, conditions of glaucoma, so, such as traumatic glaucoma. And the treatment of uh, glaucoma is quite different depending on the type of glaucoma you have. So any clues that you can give us goes a long way in helping us uh, diagnose the type of glaucoma you have and then um, decide on what would be the best management for your condition. Now, family history of glaucoma. Now, this almost always increases your risk of glaucoma, but what I like to find out is how did the glaucoma affect your family member? Because that gives me an indication of how aggressive the glaucoma can be. So for example, if the glaucoma was in your uh, parent uh, and was diagnosed at age of 80, and um, they were started on drops and they were only on drops, then I know that that's a less aggressive form of glaucoma compared to a sibling who was diagnosed in their 40s and had glaucoma surgery uh, soon after the diagnosis. So, so it's not only who has glaucoma, but how, how did your glaucoma present and what kind of treatment they have is quite useful. Um, and finally, let us know if you have any drug allergies. As I've mentioned, that tends to have an impact on the type of medications that we prescribe for you. Now, um, if you can't speak English or English is um, limited, it's important that you let us know early. So you can either contact the secretary or the booking teams in the hospital to arrange for an interpreter. Uh, and they will also tend to organize a much longer appointment for you. And if that fails, uh, Google Translator or a phone interpreter may be very useful. 
Um, you're always welcome to bring a family a friend or a family member, but officially they cannot be, uh, they cannot function as a medical interpreter, especially when it comes to giving consent for a surgical procedure. Okay, so let's talk about the examination itself. So um, every room is set up quite differently, but, um, but essentially when you go into the room, you'll be invited to take a seat in, uh, in, a, in a large dentist chair. Um, we would usually start up with testing your vision. Uh, we would do what's called a slit lamp examination. So that's where we use a microscope to assess the health of your eye, the front and the back of the eye. And what I have in this video here is what a slit lamp uh, examination looks like from a patient's perspective. Um, it can be quite bright when we do a slit lamp examination. Uh, and if that's the case, just let us know and we will try our best to dim the light. Um, we would do what's called gonioscopy, uh, which is assessing the drainage of the front of the eye, bundoscopy, which is looking at the back of the eye, tonometry, which is measuring the pressure, and then other adjunctive investigations such as visual fields, OCTs, and taking photos of your eye. So I'll run through all of this um, in a sequence, okay? Oops, there you go. So as I mentioned, uh, we do test your vision and you've got, you have different ways of measuring vision, but this is one of the charts that we tend to do when we test vision. Um, vision assessment is crucial because it tells us what the function of vision is. Um, and it's crucial that you bring your glasses for the assessment. If you wear contact lenses and you don't have glasses, bring a case to remove your lenses because not every practice or hospital setting has contact lens solution or contact lens cases. Now your vision will be measured uh, with, um, with and without your glasses or contact lenses. And we usually use uh, this little device here, which is called an occluder. Now we check your vision without, uh, uh, without this little um, 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 device in front, which is called pinhole. So if you notice your vision is better without a pinhole compared to, um, uh, sorry, if your vision is better with a pinhole compared to without a pinhole, that suggests to us that your glasses uh, may not be up to date or you may need to update your glasses to improve your vision. Uh, and if your vision doesn't improve, that suggests that something uh, may be happening to the retina or, or the nerve at the back of your eye, okay? So as I mentioned, um, when you come into the consultation room, this is the, the biggest chair, the most comfortable chair is your chair. So, and like a dentist chair, the chair can go up and down uh, and um, it's important that you're comfortable. So when we do um, position you on the slit lamp and on this uh, picture here, this is where your chin goes. Your chin has to be right against the chin rest and your forehead right against this head rest. And that's crucial because if you're not well positioned, we could get errors in the measurements of your pressure and we won't have the lens in focus to assess or have a look at the back of your eyes. So it's crucial you're in the right position. And if you have issues with your neck or your back, just let us know because we can adjust the position of the chair to make the whole appointment a lot more comfortable for you. So we will measure your pressure uh, at the time of your consultation. And there are various ways to measure your pressure, but this device, which I'm showing here, it's called the Goldman uh, Applanation Tonometer, and it's the most accurate way of measuring your pressure. Now, having said that, if you hold your breath or if you squeeze your eyes, that can falsely elevate the pressure. So what I tend to do is I, I think it's really important to build rapport uh, with my patient uh, before I start doing this. And what I typically do is I get my patients to look down, and when I get them to look straight ahead, I get them to look at one of these knobs on the slit lamp. So what I tend to do is when they're looking down, I'm actually bringing the machine really close to the eye. And so when they look straight ahead, they're not aware of that apprehension that most people have when something's coming towards them. And uh, we may take a series of pressure so we get the most accurate pressure reading. But when we do this, 
we really are trying to be as gentle as we can on your eye. Now, other techniques of measuring pressure uh, may involve uh, using an air puff or there's a little device which is handheld in front of uh, the eye, which has a little small little probe which gently touches your eye. Um, the good thing about that is you don't need to have anesthetic, but none of those procedures are as accurate as using the Roman uh, tonometer. The other thing to consider is um, the fact that some of our patients, um, because they have local anesthetic on the eye, uh, the eyes will be numb for about half an hour. So it's important that you don't rub your eye because you might uh, get a little scratch on the front of your eye. Okay, moving on to tonometry. So glaucoma is essentially a plumbing problem. And so as being a plumber, you're, we would like to see where the pipes are and where the gutters are. So this technique, uh, which is using a special lens on the surface of your eye, it's called a gonioscopy lens, allows us to look at the plumbing or the drain. So to do this, we would put a bit of coupling liquid in the, um, in, on the lens itself, and we'll place it on your eye very gently, and you will feel a bit of pressure on the eye. Occasionally, some of that liquid can come down your cheeks, which is quite normal. Um, and honestly, don't worry about it. We'll give you a tissue to get rid of it. And the technique doesn't, um, the procedure doesn't tend to take too long. Now, this is also followed by having a look at the back of your eye. Um, now, as glaucoma is a reasonably complex condition to diagnose, we tend to use lots of machines to help us make the diagnosis. So this machine here is a machine which we use to take a photo of the back of your eye. And um, when you look through the machine, the technician will guide you. You'll have a light or what's called a fixation target to look at. And sometimes the machines can be quite close to you. As you can see here, uh, in the demonstration, this person is literally, um, you know, kissing the machine. So do not be alarmed by that. And you may, um, you may be asked to um, look at that target. And while you're looking at that target, a very bright flash of light may shine in your eye. And do not be concerned about that, okay? We also tend to take scans of the retina and the nerve at the back of the eye. So the machine that we use to do that, it's called an OCT machine. And when you look through the machine, uh, this fixation target is this green light here. And occasionally the light may not be directly in front of your vision. We may have that off in a tangent. And that's not an error. It's because when we look at the view on the other side, we may find an area which we are a bit more concerned about. And so we use that fixation target to move, the, move your eye where you look at so that we can um, home in onto that area of abnormality. Um, you will see here on this machine here, it's got a double chin. And that is because the alignment for assessing your left eye is different from the right eye. And so the technician will guide you through this. Now, this is a visual fields machine. And the visual fields machine is crucial for assessing the function of the optic nerve itself. Um, similar to the other device, it's got a double chin. So we will ask you to put your chin on the chin rest and your head needs to be right against the head rest. And this here is um, where the lenses are used for dialed in to correct for any uh, refractive error or prescription you might have. Some of the older devices have trial lenses, which we may put onto the, onto the machine to allow you to see. Uh, and if you think it's uh, blurry or dirty, please let us know. Or if you think the lens is too far away, let us know. Because all of those little small um, positional uh, changes or the clarity of the lens has an impact on how well you do in the test. So what, what happens is the technician will uh, line you up for the test and we then to do some checks prior to starting the test. 
and we would usually test each eye separately. And so you'll be using a little pirate patch on the other eye. So in this test, what you will be expected to do is to look at the central light here. And while looking at the central light, you'll see other lights appear elsewhere. And when you see light appearing, you have to press a little trigger button. Now, um, what you'll notice here is that the different lights come up at different speeds. Uh, they also have different locations and they have different intensities. And the same area may be tested a couple of times. Now, and that's done intentionally. The machine has to assess what is called your threshold of your ability to see light in that particular area of your vision. And so what it does is it goes through an algorithm and establishes your threshold and then to check, to see if you're paying attention, I'll go and put an even brighter spot in that side to see if you press the trigger. And if you don't, that is considered a false negative. And on the other hand, it will also shine light into areas which are known to have no, no uh, vision, which are called blind spots or normal blind spots in your vision. And if you press the trigger, then it will call that as a false negative. And these are specific indices that we look at to assess, to see whether the test may be accurate or not. Now, for those of you who have done this test, you will know that it can be quite difficult. And some of the older machines take a much longer time to do the test. And some patients could spend about 20 minutes doing this test. And it's in a very dark room. So um, my suggestion is get a good night's sleep prior to having the test and um, make sure you go to the toilet before starting the test because you do have to concentrate during the test. And if you are finding the test very difficult and you need a rest, if you hold, on, hold down that trigger button um, just long enough, that will pause the test and the, clinician, the technician could come along and just check and see that you're okay. Moving forward to uh, the results, uh, of, of how these test results are actually uh, extrapolated. So at the conclusion of the different glaucoma tests, um, your clinician will interpret the results from printouts. Now, this is an example of the printout from the, uh, from the OCT. Now, the OCT stands for Optical Coherence Tomography, which literally means making a map of your eye using light. So the way how the machine works is it shines light into the eye and that light reflects off the retina. And the different layers of the retina have different levels of reflectance. And using this um, level of reflectance, the machine's extremely smart and it comes up with this beautiful configurations of the retina at the back of your eye. And if, if we do the same around the nerve, then we can actually extrapolate and get uh, a view of what the structure of the nerve looks like at different areas. Now, if you imagine, if this is a picture of the nerve at the back of the eye, if you use a cookie cutter in that circle around the nerve and you lay it out, you can actually find different points of the nerve where we can then figure out the thickness of the nerve. And that result is then extrapolated onto this graph here which looks at the RNFL thickness, which stands for retinal nerve fiber layer thickness. Now, the solid line here is for the right eye and the detached line here is for the left eye. So at each point here, we can figure out what the thickness of the nerve is. And we can also figure out what the average nerve thickness is. And what we know is in patients with glaucoma, we have a loss of nerve fibers in the eye. And so we can tell if someone's got an area of abnormality that we should be concerned about. And we can also judge based on the episodic visits you come back as to whether that nerve area of interest is getting thinner and thinner. And if it is progressing, then it means that we have to up our treatment of your glaucoma to stop things from progressing. So 
the fact that this nerve gets thinner and thinner over time is an issue in glaucoma. Now, the other things uh, which are quite useful here, and I tend to show my patients these maps, is to show them where the area of thinning is. So all these red areas and yellow areas are areas where the nerve is much thinner. And red means that the nerve is less than 1% of normal, yellow is between 1% to 5% of normal, and green is between 5 to 95 centile. So you can still have glaucoma despite being in the green zone, uh, because it's a wide variant, but, but it gives us an idea as a descriptive way of telling our patient where the area of abnormality is, and it helps us kind of hone in a focus into an area of concern. Now, obviously, trying to run through what each one of these parameters refers to or what we're looking for is outside the scope of this talk, and we ophthalmologists train for a long time to try to figure out what they represent. But I'm hoping that you understand why we're doing this test and what we're looking for, um, so that when you attend your consultation, you're feeling empowered to ask uh, the clinician, what about uh, this area of concern? Is it an area of concern and what they're looking for? Now, this is a scan of also from the same machine, the OCT, of the front of the eye, so this part of the eye. And what we have here is the cornea and the configuration of the drainage of the eye and this structure here, which is called the iris. Now, I find that this is very useful in explaining the concept of narrow drainage angles to some of my patients. So like I said, glaucoma is a plumbing issue. And so when fluid is created within the eye, it's created by the tap here, which is called the ciliary body. And it basically makes this journey into this area of the drainage. What we want is a nice open drainage and you can still get open angle glaucoma, but in some patients that drainage is shut, as you can see here, very narrow. And so that gives patients who have to understand what narrow drainage angles an appreciation of what their own anatomy of the eye is. So not something from the textbook, but in real time, I can show them that this is what's happening in the eye and what they're at risk of, which is angle closure glaucoma and what treatment we can offer them, which is laser peripheral in most uh, cases. So once again, this helps to, um, to educate yourself about what we are seeing and then you making that decision as to whether you want any interventions to be performed. So as I've mentioned, um, it's important for us to look at the back of the eye. So when we use a special lens to look at the back of the eye, the retina, we are looking at this. So imagine if you're inside your eye and you're looking towards the nerve, this is what you will see. So that's the nerve, the central part here, and that nerve goes all the way to the brain, the optic nerve, and you've got this darker area here, which is called the macula. The macula is very important in very fine vision and color vision and can be associated with conditions such as age-related macular degeneration. And we look at these blood vessels here at the back of the eye, uh, which gets affected, uh, by, uh, affected by conditions such as hypertension or diabetes. And we look at the retina, uh, which is this beautiful colored, uh, red colored wallpaper, which is, uh, which is where the light is getting detected to. And that signal from the retina is what forms the impulses which go up to the nerve, which then goes all the way to the brain, and that's how we can see. So I find that it's very useful to, sh to show my patients this, because when you go for a glaucoma consult, we're not only looking at the nerve, we're actually looking at the whole eye, and we're trying to assess, even in some cases, the function of the brain, because the nerve is contiguous to your brain. So this is to give an understanding to the patient that to reassure them that whether there is any other problems and what we're going to do about it. Now, a lot of my patients, when they look at this picture, um, they usually get quite alarmed by these changes here, which is actually just the eyelashes. It's just with the, the photos that we tend to take, because you're so close to the machine, 
And a lot of glaucoma patients on latanoprosin have got very long eyelashes. So we, um, we do actually take pictures of the eyelashes too, okay? So in that picture earlier, the focus was on the retina. And in this picture here, we're taking a photo of the optic nerve itself. And if you look at the nerve here, the best analogy I tell, you know, I tell my patients is imagine the nerve looks like a bicycle tire. And so what we want is this area of the tire to be nice and fat. It needs, so because that's called the neural retina rim. So it needs to be nice and fat. And that's a healthy nerve. If you have glaucoma, that tire gets thinner and thinner. And that is where it becomes an issue. The other things we look for is whether or not there's any hemorrhages associated with the nerve. And I'm sure uh, you may have heard of a, what's called a cup to disc ratio. So this area in the middle part is called the cup. And this area here is called the disc. So the bigger the ratio of the cup to disc ratio, the more concern we get. Now, this is a printout of the visual field test. So this printout is actually really useful for us uh, because it really helps us and was the major way how we diagnosed glaucoma for many, many years before the advent of uh, OCT. So when we look at this, uh, we get an idea as to how reliable your results are. So we talked about fixation losses and false positives and false negatives. So it gives an idea similar to your rat test, whether or not there's a, uh, there might be something uh, which is um, an error in the, in the testing process itself. And that's where when you do your rat test, for example, you've got a control line. So that's essentially what the control of the test is. Is it a good test or not? Now, we ophthalmologists actually look at all these different points here, but what I tell my patients is, just look at this, um, which is called a grayscale. And this is a normal visual field here on the left. Everyone has a normal blind spot here, so do not get concerned about that. However, we do get worried if someone has uh, progressive areas of this grayness or darkness here, because that is where someone is losing their peripheral vision. And when this progresses further and further, then that is called advancing glaucoma. Now, it also tells us where the glaucoma is affecting the eye or the vision. So this person, for example, is losing their central vision uh, with glaucoma. And then, well, if this patient, and this is a projection of their visual field on the left eye, they're losing the upper and nasal part, so towards the nose part of vision in their eye. And once again, this is to educate someone as to how the glaucoma is affecting your peripheral vision and whether things are getting worse. And I find that this is particularly crucial when we have to have that discussion about someone's safety to drive, because a lot of patients with glaucoma are not aware that glaucoma is affecting your vision. It's largely an asymptomatic condition until it gets too advanced. But what this test does, it gives us an idea as to what you're missing on your peripheral vision. And then it helps us um, advise you on your safety. And it's not about just keeping you safe, but it's also about keeping the rest of the public safe. So in summary, the clinicians, well, we look at the results and the idea is to determine if you are at risk or have glaucoma based on the evidence of looking at the structure and the function. The aim here is also to empower you to help come up with a management in a partnership situation. Now, it's likely that you're going to be seeing the same clinician for many years to come. So it's crucial that you get along with them. And if you don't get along with them, consider a different clinician. Now, also think about whether you need support. If, you, if, you, if it's news that you are not expecting, consider bringing your partner or support person because we know that only 25 to 30% of the information we share with you is actually going to sink in. So the more the people to kind of understand, um, understand what we're discussing with you, the better it is. Obviously, there's restrictions around how many people you can bring at the time of COVID. 
what I've done with some of my patients is just place um, the family member on, uh, on the speakerphone so they can actually understand, uh, particularly when you start coming up with a management plan. Now, your consultation doesn't quite end there as to when you come up with a management. Follow-up is also very crucial. And what you want to know is when you leave that consultation, when is the follow-up? What are we going to look up for for the follow-up? And what testing, if it needs to be done, and what, are, what do I have to watch out for in between? So to give you an example, if I start someone with drops, I'm usually giving them information and I have printouts of glaucoma New Zealand leaflets or side effects of medications. So I'll tell my patient that, look, if I'm going to start your on the Tylopros, for example, you would expect your eyes to be a little bit red or irritated. Um, the eyelashes will grow longer. In some patients, the, colors, uh, the color of the eye is going to change and you might get a bit of pigmentation changes on the skin. But if this is a problem for you, please let me know when you come back for your follow-up in six weeks' time. And when I see you in six weeks' time, I'm also trying to assess what the pressure is to decide whether or not we've achieved our target of lowering your pressure. And what I want to achieve for you would be a 30 or 40% reduction in your pressure. And all of that is dependent on that person's uh, glaucoma uh, risk and, um, or how severe the glaucoma is. And on the other hand, if a patient has narrow drainage angles, I would say, look, um, it's crucial that you're aware that you're at risk of acute angle closure glaucoma, which is a potentially blinding condition. And it's an emergency um, if you do notice halos in your vision, blurry vision, nausea and vomiting, because this suggests that you may get acute angle closure glaucoma. And if you have this, this is my card, get in touch with me or get in touch with the emergency eye clinic because you need to be seen as soon as possible so that we can start, uh, so that we can do, uh, so that we can treat the pressure. So it's crucial that for you to understand where to from here, what is the follow-up and what are we gonna look for in the follow-up? Now, what I'm gonna go through next, uh, this little uh, snippets of, um, uh, stories which demonstrates to you how important the assessment is and how we may be able to help you through your assessment. So as I, as I mentioned, for a lot of patients, coming for an eye examination is very intimidating. And for other patients, it is quite, a, quite, a, um, it's quite demanding because you have to take time off work or you might have to travel very long distances or in some patients even have taken an ambulance to come and see us in the eye clinic, and it takes a long time to be seen, particularly if you're waiting in the public hospital. So I just want to give you ideas of how we can make that process a bit better for you. So Daniel here is a young guy. Uh, he was, he's very fit, and he was referred by his optometrist because he had very large discs. So Daniel was not very forthcoming with information. Um, he didn't really want to be here. He was unsure about what large this meant. And he said that, I suppose the optometrist thinks that it could be glaucoma, but glaucoma only tends to affect older people. So I really don't know why I'm here. Michael here, on the other hand, has a diagnosis of glaucoma. He is a businessman, always on the phone. When he comes for his consultation, He's usually trying to fit in a Zoom consultation while he's doing his visual field test. So he's a bit naughty like that. So we've always had to tell him, no, you've got to put your phone down. And in his situation, um, the optometrist who's been keeping an eye on him was getting concerned because his visual standard, so his visual field was getting worse. And she was worried that he may not be able to drive. And from his perspective, um, he's in a bit of denial. You know, he feels that maybe, um, you know, this glaucoma is not that bad. And even, and I, you know, we'll see how things go. But, um, you know, if you stop me from driving, that's going to affect my livelihood. So I'm not going to be very happy with you. And I can afford a lawyer, so make sure you do a good job. And, um, and then there's Julie here. And this is not uncommon, where patients are diagnosed uh, are felt 
suggest that they may have narrow drainage angles. And there are lots of women who are, um, uh, well, investing into their eyelashes and they have beautiful long eyelashes, which uh, they don't want you to touch. They don't want their eyes to be touched and they don't want any drops because they're worried that you might damage their uh, beautiful um, uh, cosmetic eyelashes. So in each one of the situations, so they're not, um, you know, they, you know, we, we have to kind of go over and beyond uh, from a normal consultation. And it's the job of, your, of, of me as a clinician and actually as a team, because sometimes you can kind of detect someone's reluctance when they're making the appointment. And so the secretary might actually tell me that so-and-so is quite a busy person. They want to come in and go out and they've got another meeting in, you know, 45 minutes. And so it's my job to kind of make this experience as stressless as possible because your relationship with me is not a one-off relationship and I expect to see you again and again and if I don't do a good enough job then you're not going to come back for your follow-up and and that's something which all of us glaucoma surgeons are quite aware of so in Daniel's case for example we he was a low risk patient for developing glaucoma but we gave him a lot of information and um, and we always sign up our patients with glaucoma in New Zealand even if they don't have glaucoma so that they get support or they know where they can get some information with and when they need it. But he was very happy to see his optometrist and we were quite happy to co-manage him with the optometrist and we made it a point for him to understand that glaucoma doesn't only affect older patients, it can happen to anyone. But in his case, uh, we, you know, he had a good enough relationship with his optometrist so we could co-manage him um, with his optometrist. Michael, on the other hand, um, we had to show him his visual field results, explain to him why he wasn't uh, meeting the full criteria for uh, driving safely. And this is uh, imposed by Land Transport New Zealand. And we are not the agents who are taking the license off him. We are there as essentially as uh, technicians or officers to see whether you meet the standards. And if you don't meet the standards, we have to explain to you why you don't meet the standards and what can be done about it. So in Michael's situation, on advice from the medical officer of land transport, the plan was for him to have a um, driving test with a occupational therapist, and that was passed, and so he could continue driving. And finally, for Julie, who was very anxious, uh, there was uh, lots of reassurance um, we tried not to do too many things at the same go. And um, she actually needed to have laser treatment for her angle closure or for her narrow drainage angle. So we gave her oral sedation for the next consult so she could have that. We dimmed the lighting, we used very relaxing music. And at the end of the day, it wasn't as bad as what she thought it was going to be. And she, she left being a very happy patient. And that's what we want to achieve. You know, a happy patient makes a happy practice and makes the whole team happy. So in conclusion, we clinicians want to give you personalized care and we want to take into account um, the diagnosis of glaucoma made on giving you evidence of where the deviation is from normalized data in order to give you a very safe plan which works for you. As you're aware, Glaucoma is a potentially blinding condition. Very few patients with glaucoma go blind from this condition, provided that they're treated well, managed well, and attend to regular follow-up. And that's what we want to keep it as, you know, keep it as a potentially blinding condition. And what we know patients want and what people want is that you want to understand your condition, you want to take control of it, and you don't want things to progress and you want to slow down any change. Now, we also know that this is not just the clinician and you, it's about being in a community and that's where Glaucoma New Zealand is here to help support you. Uh, almost certainly though, you also have other Facebook groups um, with uh, patients who have glaucoma. Um, and I think it's really important to try to reach out to as much help as you can get. And finally, 
finishing off with reaching out, do feel free to contact me if you have any questions. I would be more than happy to help you. So thank you for listening and have